Uh, so, knowledge is power, understanding Git. Okay, so one, Git's one of those things where you've, um, you start off, you think, oh, I've got the hang of Git, and then you do something, and it all goes horribly, horribly wrong. So, this is the, where the point of Git, where you have to learn a bit about how it works underneath the hood to truly understand it. It's got very le leaky abstractions, um, and you need to sort of be able to understand those to really get work done. Um, see, the problem is there's two ways of learning Git. One is from the bottom up, and then people will say things like this. Git is fundamentally a content addressable file system. Yeah, that's great, but it's also bugger all use if you actually just want to get your work done on a day-to-day -day ba basis. You work, you, you, somebody's come along and said, we're moving some subversion, we're moving from CVS, we're moving into Git, and you want to know what do I actually do? What is the equivalent of SVN checkout, and what is the equivalent of SVN commit? Things like that. Um, so this content addressable file system, acyclic graphs, all that crap is of no use to you at all when you're trying to get work done. Now, last year I was at um, Git Merge in France, um, along with uh, GitHub, who, despite what well, you may have heard, actually last year Git, uh, GitHub get on quite well at a personal level. We certainly go drinking a lot. Uh, so, but at, at, Git, at Git Merge, um, Emma Jane Hodbin Westby. Great speaker. If you get the chance to see her, uh, I recommend it. We actually ended up pulling her along to all of our um, Atlassian events because she's really, really good and has interesting insights. But she works a lot in educating people about how to learn, about how to learn Git. Not, and she, she comes from the very much the top-down point of view. People want to get their job done. Here's how you get started. Here's how you get... Um, here's a, you get your code out. Here's how you commit. Here's little gotchas like the, sta the staging environment and um, stashes and things like that. So the the only stuff about the directed acyclic graphs is no use to you at that point. However, after a while, you start getting a bit more confident. After a while, you start building real things in Git. And you start actually seeing, oh, yeah, I can actually do this. I've heard about this Git reset. I've heard about this Git re rebase. That sounds great. I'll use that. And that's when things start to go horribly wrong. Even the simple thing, the things that Git is really, really good at, like branching and merging, um, can rapidly get out of hand. This, by the way, this is not a nightmare scenario. This is actually a recommended workflow. I shit you not. Do not do this. Okay, start at the bottom, very simple, one branch, one merge. If you need to get more complicated, add on top as necessary. This is, yeah, this is completely out of control. But the thing is, if you start getting to this sort of scenario, that kind of clone versus commit versus, um, you know, stash and all the rest is not really going to help you very much. At some point, you're going to have to get untangle this mess, and then there's going to be some guy in the organization who has to understand Git. So presumably, you've all seen this XKCD, comic from a couple of months ago, well, probably about a year ago now. Um, it's, it's basically true. There is, um, there's, um, basically, most people get to this stage where they go, oh, I don't understand this anymore, and they have just blown it away and start, start again because they've got into such a complete and utter mess. Now, you're also, if you, if you know XKCD, there is the hidden text in it as well. There's always that one guy. He will not shut up, but he's really, really useful. You, you have a look at your report and go, oh, yeah, 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 what you've done is you've rebased, but you, ha well, you, haven't, you haven't reset before you've done that, so your working directory is now out of sync. You've done a git rebase soft instead of risk git rebase hard, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so re reset soft, reset hard, so you know, even I'm doing it. Um, and but eventually, you'll get what you need to do. The thing is, this guy doesn't know what those commands are. The secret here is, the commands that are mentioned there, he doesn't know that they exist. He's assumed they exist. Because if you understand the underlying model of Git from the bottom up, you will know what commands must exist logically to get you out of trouble. You assume, if I know that Git model works like this, then there must be a command that makes it do that. I just got to go and off and find that command. And later on, I'll show you literally a real world example of how I, I, I did that when I show you that. That one weird trick that every talk has to have now. So, without further ado, we're going to move on to um, Git internal terminals. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you will be that really annoying guy in, in, in your team, the one who understands Git and gets people out of trouble, which is really good job security, by the way. So, without further ado, 
Git internals. Let's start right down at the bottom. We're, gonna, we're not going to go about, uh, on about acyclic graphs yet. We're not going to go on about content addressable file systems. I'm going to show ra rather than tell. I'll tell you later. Don't worry. At the bottom of the stack that is Git is the blob. That's really it. Everything is just blobs all chained together at the end of the day. Now, what's in the blobs changes, so it's kind of um, con it's contextual. But at the bottom level, um, everything is a blob. The simplest blob is the content, something that is essentially a binary blob that Git has no idea about. Now, that includes text files. <laughs> Git doesn't have no fundamental awareness of text files at its lowest level. Higher up, when we start looking at things like merging, yes, Git will, will understand that certain things are text files, and it will um, understand how to operate on them. But at its lowest level, it doesn't care. Everything is just a blob. A blob is nothing more than the contents of, a, of an object. It's compre Zlib compressed. It has a header stuck on it, just to help identify it um, on the file system, if you do come across a, ro a rogue one. And then um, it is hashed. It's a SHA-1 hash, and that identifies it. And that's kind of where the content addressable file system comes in, but we will get to that. Don't worry about that. The next level up is the tree. A tree is also a blob, but it's a blob where Git understands what the content is. Um, and in particular, the tree points at other blobs, and potentially, which could be other trees. And it gives it additional metadata. So say, there's no file names associated with these blobs. The tree gives it a file name. Now, trees can point to other trees, or they can point at blobs, and they can give them names, and they can give them additional metadata, such as file permissions, whether it's executable or not. This looks an awful lot like a Unix recursive file system, um, which is not surprising, given it's actually written by a Unix kernel developer. Um, and at the top level, we have something called a commit. A commit points at a tree. Well, it, it can point at a blob. Usually, it will point at a tree. But we can, we, we can manipulate this any way we want. So a commit points at a tree. And that tree defines a set of objects. Now, the fact that there's no file names associated with those low-level blobs is what we talk about in the address of file system. And I'll show you that now. So let's, go, let's just do this. Let's show this from the ground up. We're going to just go to the command line and do git init. Git init gives you an empty git repository. Um, now, it does actually create a bunch of additional boilerplates that isn't important and has no role initially, which I'm not going to you know, brush over that now because it's not, not important. It creates a bunch of dummy hooks that you can en enable if you want. But we don't worry about that. At its core, a git init creates a completely empty repository with nothing in it. So if we look at the, um, there's a, and as you probably know, that inside the git repository, there is a .git directory. And inside there is all of the information about your repository. The stuff that's outside of that, your actual files, what's called a working tree. When git looks inside that and rebuilds the working state of any given commit. However, that is really additional. You can wipe all that out and just pr tell git to reset, and it will pull all that information out again. So the real information is stored inside the .git directory. Inside the docket directory is a directory called objects, and this is where all of our blobs are stored. So let's get in there and let's start manipulating and creating some con content for Git. Um, by the way, I should jump back a bit. Um, so the Git init is obvious, but tree is just a command that is, will do a, a recursive um, listing of a directory. So this is just showing you via the coloring that there is nothing in these directories. These are two empty directories, info and pack. So we're going to do two more commands now. We're going to do touch. Touch in Unix world can mean two things. It um, will either update at the timestamp on a file, or it's a convenient way of creating an empty file if one does not exist. So we're going to create a completely empty file called some file. And then we're going to add it. We're going to say, git, please track this file. Don't commit it yet. Just be aware that this is something we're going to want changes to be tracked in. And then we can just go back and have a look at our git objects tree. As you can see, there is now a single object in there. It's zlib compressed, it's sha1 hashed, and the sha1 hash is used as the file name. That's not the file's file name. The file's file name is some text um, or something. I forget, I forget what I actually even said. Um, but as you can see, we, um, it's inside another directory, e6. That's the first two digits of the sha1 hash. 
Um, the rest of it is the, is the remainder of the SHA-1 hash. The reason it does that is to spread the load out across the directory system. Rather than having one directory with all the files, you have um, 255 directories with the files spread out across them. That's really just a local file system optimization and not particularly important. You could, do, you could implement it differently if you so desired. That's not important. But we're going to do a commit. We want to say, well, now we've got this state. We've put this file in there that's empty. And we're going to um, commit it. So we'll just do a git commit with the first commit in it. Now we have three objects in here, three blobs. The first one is, the, is our object, our empty file. The second one is our tree. And the third one is our commit. This is it. This is the lowest level. Now, interesting fact, when I talk about um, content addressable file systems, that blob is of an empty file. Now, if I go to another completely separate repository and create another empty file, what will the hash be? It'd be the same. If I create another repository, uh, another file in this repository that's empty, and I, I, I add it, what's going to happen? It's going to be the same. Anywhere in the known mathematical universe where the laws of maths apply, or laws of physics apply, any empty file in a Git repository will always be that. And that is what a content addressable file system means. It means any object anywhere in the, in the universe that has the same content will have the same hash against it. We can add additional metadata on top of it. We, that's all in the trees. But the objects are always the same if they had the same content to them. So, in summary, that is Git in a nutshell, at its simplest level. So it's not that complicated, with one little caveat. Commits can point at trees. Commits can even point directly at objects. They are used sometimes in that way. However, they can also point at other commits. So what we have here is commits can point to other commits which point to different trees, which point to different objects. And this is the contents of your, direct, your repository changing over time. So this really is the core of Git. Everything else is built on top of these basic abstractions. And I'll start, we're gonna, well, in a minute, we'll build our way up that tree and talk about some of the higher level abstractions. But this is why that person, can t that person in that text file can say, oh, I know, there must be a way to do this because He's looked at this and reasoned about how these different, three different types of objects might be linked to get together and assumed there must be a, file, a command somewhere that allows you to manipulate and change that relationship. Um, just to show you another little aspect of this, we're going to make a minor change to that file. We're going to add an empty comment in it, or a very simple com comment in it. We're going to add that file again, and let's have a look at the tree again. This is that entirely new blob. This is the content addressable again. Because that file is no longer empty, it is actually a completely separate object now. So this is really, at its core, Git. It's really just objects, and objects that point to each other. But objects by themselves are just hashes, and hashes aren't a hell of a lot of use. Sure, you can, you can use the tree to point at the objects, and you can use the commits to point at the trees, or the other objects, or whatever, but then you've got to point at the commits, so and what the hell is that use? They're all hashes, and those aren't very practical. So we're going to think a little bit more about um, what we want on top of that to make it a little bit more usable in the real world. So we'll jump one, up, one level up the tree now, and we're going to look at the refs, branches, and tags. So you've probably heard of refs. You probably don't know much, that, much about, about them. Possibly you do. Um, you probably, you've almost certainly definitely heard of, of bra bra branches and probably tags as well. So these are all very much the same, the same thing. So what is a ref? A ref is just a pointer to an object, simple as that. That is all it is. It is literally a name given to a hash of an object. That object might be a tree, might be a, um, a blob, or it's more likely, in practical terms, it's going to be a commit. It's a way of giving a commit a name. It is nothing more than a var variable. Now, by the way, if you see any similarity to uh, programming languages 
And in particular, J JVM is a fairly good model to actually think about Git in some ways. There's very, very real reason for that. Refs are basically like va variable names. Um, and objects are very much like objects stored in memory with relationships to each other. So there's one other way to bear it in mind as well. But a ref is just a point to an object. Now, we don't generally manipulate refs directly very often. We more often use the high-level abstractions. They're using um, refs are just, um, or branches and tags are just refs. They have some special semantics, but that's convention. But branches and tags are just refs. A branch is just a different ref pointing to a different object. Now, a object can have multiple children, and that is how you create a branch. What you do is you have, rather than merely moving up along, along a linear path, you create a new ref, a branch, and that takes a different path. The parents are, remains the same at some point in the history, but you are now going on a, off on a divergent branch path. Um, briefly, what is a tag? Well, a tag is just a special ref that's used to mark a commit in the history. Um, usually, this will be the most common one is a release point. So this is the version of the, um, the code that was out, went out with version 1.2. So you can track your, your, that point in history. It's nothing more than a marker. There are special tags. You can attach a commit to a tag, and that tag points at a, a, another commit that's an object, and that gives you the, a way to annotate a given tag and gives you a way to sign tags. But at simplest level, a tag is just a, by convention, a point in history. You can go back and actually manipulate those. Like, my, like many things in, in Git, it diverge from traditional version control systems. You can go back in history and modify history. You generally shouldn't, unless you have a good re reason to, but you can go back and manipulate these tags if you need to. So let's, once again, jump down into the command line, have a quick look at this. So we're going to create a tag, just call it a tag, and we're going to attach a message to it, which is just a tag. We're also going to create a new branch, and we're going to look inside a different part of the git.git .git repository. And you can see what's happened in here is we now have a, a directory called git refs, and that stores our refs. Now we split them up into useful into, into different parts of it. One for the tags, which is obvious. The other one is heads. Heads are merely how we refer to branches on the whole. Um, it, a head will normally mean a, a branch will generally point to the end of a stream of development, a string a string of commits. So these are the heads are our two br branches. There's a branch and master. Master is the default branch, but again, that's just convention. If you don't want master to be the default branch, you can create your default branch if you want and destroy master. Git doesn't prescribe anything like that. It's just convention. And the tags, we have the tag in there. And if we, we do cat. If you don't know, cat just blasts the file out by, by default. We'll just display a file. As you can see, all that is in the branch is the hash. This is why branching in Git is so incredibly fast. It's literally writing a bunch of characters to a file. That is all it is to create a branch. That's why it's almost free. Um, so we know a bit about branches and tags now, and refs. I'm going to talk about one of the things that general people often screw up um, briefly. What is a reset? Now, there is a reason for me bringing this up in the context of refs, and I'll show you in a second. But what is a, is a reset? How many people here have used reset in the past? How many people fucked it up? Yeah, the rest are lying, all right? It's a rite of passage in Git to do a reset hard and go, oh, shit, what have I just done? And we'll get back to that. I'll show you how to, show you how, how to fix that. In fact, I'll give you a heavy clue any second now. But all Git does with reset, reset actually is one of the heavily overloaded um, commands inside Git, but its simplest le uh, level, it does all it does is will take a tag, a ref, a branch, usually, and change its state. So what we're going to do here, new Git reset hard is one of those, the overloaded part. When the Git does the reset and moves the reference, most usually the branch endpoint, what it does, it, ha it has a choice. What's it going to do with the working directory? It's changing internal state, but you have your checked out copy as well. 
What happens to the checked out copy after you do that move? Hard is the most extreme one. It says, forget whatever was in the working tree, blow it away, reset it to the state that I'm giving you now. Um, the last bit, the feature with the up little up tag, the little car carrot on the end, um, means parent. There's a whole little sub-language inside Git for referencing the relationship between different refs. Nine times out of ten, you're not going to need to know that. It's one of those things that's kind of handy to know if you're really into the, into the weeds, but by then you really should understand what's going on anyway. There's a little mini language for saying uh, this commit, but two behind it, things like that. But the carrot means just whatever this is pointing to, one back. So we're just going to jump back to the parent, blow away the last commit, and replace it with, with whatever was in the last commit. So that is that. And now it will just move that tag, the ref. That is at the simplest level. There are different things you could do as a side effect, but that's all it really does. Now, because you're doing this through here, you're not going in there and writing these files directly. You're telling Git, I want the ref to move. Well, Git's going, this is kind of high risk stuff here when you're messing around with this. This is one of the li um, least understood fe features inside Git, is something called the ref log. Whenever you manipulate a ref, no matter how you do it, other than if you, theoretically, you can go in and manipulate those files directly, don't recommend doing that. But anytime you, you manipulate a ref in any way, creating a branch, destroying a branch, um, doing a commit, whatever, anything that moves a ref, Git makes an entry in something called the ref log. This is really, really useful, and we're going to use that later to, to get out of trouble. This is one of simp the most important ways of getting out of trouble in Git. If you do something and you don't know what the hell just happened, go look in the ref log and you can get back to the previous state. Now, there's a couple of caveats here. It's local only to the local, to lo lo local repository. It's not going to get pushed up when you do a push. It wouldn't make any sense. Um, and it does time out after a certain amount of time, 90 days by default. Um, and uh, you, can manip you can change that. There is a, a git con con config file you can, in your home directory or inside the git repository itself. You can change that. You can say, I want to be longer, shorter, whatever. But it keeps a ref log for 90 days. That's pretty, oops, sorry. Um, that's pretty good. Sorry. I hate these things. I should go back to bloody text files. Um, so, but as you can see, as we've made Changes with commits, checkouts, commits, cherry picks, all this stuff you heard about, anything that manipulates a ref will get entered in the ref log. And it will also show you the hash, which gives the ability to directly manipulate that and get out of trouble. And we'll come to that in a bit and show you how you can do, do that. Now, there is one other gotcha here. And this is where the JVM side of things really does start to show. Now, if you think about it a little bit, Git creates a lot of these objects. And you do um, an add, an add, an add, and you're changing one character at a time, and do an add, or one character, an add, one character, and an add, or one character, and a commit, all of these. All of these build up over time. A lot of these, um, if you have a temporary branch, you work on them throw away. What happens to all of those objects? Now, one of the fundamental insights of Git in its original form, it's changed a little bit since then, but in this original form, one of the insights of it was that disk space is cheap. So the original Git had this idea of not storing deltas in the same way that subversion does. Subversion will, every time you make a commit, it looks at the changes and only stores the bits that have changed. The problem is that makes manipulation of subversion history very, very hard. Subversion thought it was a good idea. Everyone who's ever seen somebody check all the company passwords into, the, into a public repository will disagree with that slightly. Been there, done that, cleaned up the bloody mess. It was a nightmare. So Git has this concept of GC that occurs at certain times, and you can do it manually. So Git GC is actually remarkably like GC inside the JVM. How many of you are familiar with how the JVM or generally any other garbage collected virtual machine language works? I'm assuming most people here have had some sort of exposure to it. So what happens is, generally objects, there'll be a root object, and lots of objects point to other objects, and then what the GC will do is occasionally go and look at the object, and if it's over a certain, amount, a certain age, go, OK, does, do we need this anymore, and trace it back through its history. And there's some very elaborate algorithms for doing this, but that is, it's the simplest idea. So what I've done here, and let's replay this. So 
So what happens is we do the git reset, we've moved our um, tag back, and we've done a GC. Well, because that object that we've moved from no longer has a parent, because it's no longer got a tag, so again, inside um, the JVM, if you've got a variable pointing to an object, that's because that keeps it alive. It's only when that variable disappears, the reference, if you like, that the object is cleaned up. Um, GC will destroy all of these old objects. Um, now, there are some, some, ca some caveats to that. The main one is it generally gives you two weeks grace period. So if you do a reset and then do a GC, it won't actually go and destroy the information straight away. It'll wait two weeks. I've done it. I forced it here. The GC prune equals all says, forget about that two-week limit. Destroy everything right now. And that's purely for the purposes of this demonstration. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Again, the, the grace period is tunable inside your Git con config, if you so wish, if you want a longer great grace period. There is one other thing it does, and I almost loathe to mention this, because it's not really important in terms of the Git model. But it is important if you're going to go poke around inside your Git, .git repositories, software should bring it up for you. And it is important if you're looking at the, um, the networking protocols, which again, you probably don't want to do. I'm not going to go into here, because it's elaborate in and of, uh, of itself. But the other thing that the Git GC does is it does a pack. Now, I mentioned that Git's fundamental idea in the original days was that every object is kept around all the time. We don't go saving deltas and stuff like that. Turns out that works great on the local file system, not so much over the network, and not when you have something the size of the Linux kernel as well, and you are, say, Linux Torvalds, and constantly merging all these this stuff in that's creating a ton of garbage objects in, uh, in them. So. What was introduced early on in Git's history was something called the pack file. The pack file does what um, subversion does up front, but only does it after the fact. And it basically delta encodes things. It says, this file here is almost the same as that file here, so we're going to only save the differences between them. Um, it does this quite intelligently after the fact. Um, and it then does a bunch of extra compression, et cetera, et cetera. Etc. This is useful for cleaning up when you've got a lot of objects on disk, and it's also useful when you're sending stuff across the network, which is obviously going to be a little bit more constrained than your average disk nowadays. Um, the reason I was almost loath to, to talk about this is because it's not really important. It doesn't change the un fundamental underlying nature of Git. That model of objects point to objects remains the same, and you can take that pack file and explode it back out into that really wasteful, huge system again if you wish so. It's merely an intermediate compression. It's like um, pointing out that you know HTML can sometimes be compressed when it comes over the wire. It's not really important to understanding HTML. So um, this is not super important to understanding Git, but it is important if you're going to poke around inside your Git repository and you're curious. Um, you want to have a quick look at this. This is actually what happens after the Git um, GC. By the way, GC will happen at certain times during pushes and pulls and so on, obviously when networking is involved. It does that quite aggressively. Um, so if you actually have any background in database design, this will probably look quite familiar to you as well. There's two files here, a pack file and a, an index file that tells, is used to look up certain files and explain how to basically rehydrate them from this compressed format. And this is why you could basically go off and just re-explode the pack file if you so wished. Now, if you're really interested in this stuff, um, it is documented. Sort of. This is a Linus Torvalds special. Um, it's high, the format's highly optimized for spinning disks. Um, in a, in a, the format is designed to be able to randomly access as fast as possible on legacy spinning disks. Um, its documentation is very, it's basically somebody said, What the hell is this pack file? And Linus Torvalds went pound, 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 pound on, in, in an e email message. And that is, then the email message was copied into the documentation directory of Git. And that is basically your documentation for the pack file. It's black art shit. Um, it is fascinating to go and read if you're into bi binary encoding, file system optimization, um, sectors on disks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is clearly written by a file systems guy. But as I say, not important. No more, it's no more important than understanding um, the, the format of a HTML file that's come over the network compressed. You uncompress it. That's, that's all it is. It's a compression format. Useful, but not super important in our, in our mental model. So we talked about um, 
objects and commits and strings of commits and bra branches, which basically just says you, oh, you've got a different point and either divergence in the history. Of course, diverging history is great, particularly if it's really cheap to do, but at some point you want to pull that history back in. And that's where things get a bit more complicated. We're going to jump up the next level up, which is the merge. Now, merges are quite com complex, and I'm going to skim over a couple of things here. Um, there are a bunch of articles we've written on atlassiansdeveloper.atlassian.com, which is, uh, explains some of the details about it. I'll introduce you to the core methods of merging and introduce you to the core ideas, but I am going to skip over some bits here because the main system that is used for mer merging is something called recursive merge, which has been optimized for the Linux kernel. It's a very powerful, but it is a little bit outside the scope of this uh, talk. The other thing is, um, it's also not necessary, and I'll show you why. So what is a merge? A merge is the re integration of two diverged points in history. This is, what you, this is what you want when you branch, is you do your merge. Um, so you've got these two points, and they have digressed. Um, someone's plugging away on master. They shouldn't be. They should be bra branching off, but let's not worry about that. Um, and someone is working on the feature in parallel. They're both making changes, and both make possibly, but not necessarily, making changes to the same file. How do we resolve that? Well. We use a commit algorithm, a merging al algorithm, ra ra rather. I'll talk about those briefly. But that, again, is a detail. What we want is because there is going to have to, going to resolve these two sets of changes which overlap, we are going to create a merge commit. This is going to store any changes necessary to resolve the two sets of changes to cause our text files to go like that. Git is quite good about doing that. and it's then going to store any additional information we need about that. One, interestingly, one of the things it stores, this is where commits are quite powerful, is commits can have more than one parent. So we talked a bit about you know, each commit has a parent that points back to the previous one that gives you the chain back to the hist in history to the original creation of the project at the start. But commits can have two parents to them. So you can have a point that says, well, this commit was made out of the joining of two other commits, two other branches in Git's history. Now, why only two? It doesn't have to be two. It could be many. You're getting crazy then. But there are cases where that makes sense, and I will explain one. Um, but it explains the history. Now, this is why, incidentally, you can delete a branch after a merge and not lose any history. Very, very useful. Generally speaking, so a certain bit, Bitbucket does this, not sure about Git, uh, GitHub and so, so on, and Stash does as well, sorry, Bitbucket ser server. Um, what happens is when you close, when you do a, a, a pull request and that effectively causes a merge, you can op optionally say, just delete the branch afterwards. That deletes the branch, but it doesn't destroy the branch history because we can walk back through our history to the merge commit and go, ah, which path we're going to go down? down? The master? or we're going to go down the feature branch, because it will actually say that we have merged the branch there. So even if you destroy branches, which are only just refs, the point of the commit, you blow that away, you'll still keep the old branch around because it's been referenced by the merge commit. That tells you the diverge, the, this history was merged at this point. Uh, now, that is not ne necessarily what people want, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And it's actually not something that will happen in every single case, if you consider the concept of, well, what happened if I created a branch, just me, and worked on my fe feature away from master, and then do a merge back onto master, and nothing's changed on master, what happens then? This is where you've heard possibly of a fast forward merge. A fast forward merge is a handy little optimization. Um, not everyone likes it. Um, what it does, it goes, look, if I've branched off and I've made a bunch of changes, but nothing's changed on the point from the point of bran 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 branching, aren't the two semantically equivalent now? And the answer is yes, they are. So at that point, we just do a little hack. Let's pretend it never happened. And we're just going to say we'll replace the, the master now with, or the target branch with the other branch. 
and you'll never know, know what happens. Now, this has, has two interesting side effects. One, if you do, as I say, delete the, bran the, the branch reference, you'll lose that history. You'll never know what happened. Literally, will there be no, re no record of that at all. Even if you do keep it around, though, you'll never know what, which point the branch occurred. There's nothing to, in there to say that we branched at a certain point and merged at a certain point. All you know is that there's, there's a spare branch tag, branch reference hanging around. So there is a way around that. If you prefer to keep a, um, a history that contains the full history, even if there was effectively a null operation there, you can do put a flag in called noff. You go git merge noff, and that will create a dummy merge commit for, for you that contains a punch, the, the pointer to the master at the point of divergence and the end point of your branch, and you can basically recreate that. It's a way of storing additional metadata. Data. Things like um, uh, Bitbucket will do that for you automatically. Um, however, not everybody likes that. Some pe people would like a clean history, and I'll show you how you can create a clean history and remove all merges from your history. Um, some people prefer to have a true history, one that um, contains all of the merge points along the way. Now. Whether or not that's a good idea is entirely up to you. At Atlassian, we tend towards the truth. We have the open company, no bullshit motto. So that's a real motto, actually. Um, and we, it's not even the most sweary one. Um, so, but we always say you should keep the history. Do, do not um, destroy that information. Always do no fast forward and make sure we have a dummy merge commit that shows that a, 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 a branch Emerge the curve. We prefer the truth. Some people, for various reasons, sometimes um, legitimate, that prefer that they have a clean history that does not show the full or expose the full process of the or the full development process. Sometimes, if you're a contractor working for a third party and the management are a bit iffy about why is all these branches in here, well, you're doing something wrong, then you, you prefer a clean, clean one. But last year, we prefer a, um, a true history, but that is really uh, just a, a matter of us of our personal uh, preferences or our, our philosophy. Um, now, when I talked about merges, I said I promised I was going to skip over them sli slightly. So there are a number of merge strategies. When you do that merge, there are different ways that you can resolve the differences. As you, as you see, if there's not really any differences, we won't do a merge at all. And obviously, if we, and if we say no fast forward, it's a no op anyway. We're just replacing one piece of history with another. Um, resolve, though, is when you actually come to do a real, um, sorry, when you come to do a real merge, you will want to have some method of resolving the differences. Now, what that method is depends entirely on what you're trying to merge. And there are different strategies for diff um, different needs. Traditionally, the one has been resolve, which is the normal merge strategy that was used. I think, believe it was used in some version, other ones, which probably didn't work very well. Um, that really just looks at the two endpoints and goes, OK, let's see if we can get these together without any conflicts. And if there's conflicts, it goes, oh, I can't do anything. And we'll dump out your set of files with a bunch of you know, noise in them that you don't have to manually clear up. Um, recursive is slightly different. Recursive is the one that was introduced with the Linux kernel and has been battle tested with the Linux kernel. What it does is it uses Git's history. Git knows about branching pointing, pointing branching points and merge points. So what it can do is walk back down the tree. Rather than just taking the information it has, it can go back down to the point where the divergence occurred and say, ah, right, this is where they changed. So only the changes along here are the ones we have to worry about, not everything. And then it will walk back up the tree, creating a, any intermediate um, merge points, and then uh, to, up to the end. This is quite com complex in itself, and I've chosen to skip over this purely for time and introduce some other interesting things. I'd like to go into it. Um, but if you do want to look into it, we do have a bunch of uh, uh, articles on developer.lassian.com about the different merge strategies. Resol recursive is the default, and it will work for you 99 times out of 100 because it's been battle-tested on a Linux kernel. If it can't resolve something, it's probably a good reason for that. Another interesting one is, remember I told you that um, a merge commit can have two parents or maybe even more. There are cases where that actually does make sense. We actually use it on developer.lassian.com. So we have this um, static uh, 
site generator that we use. Um, so, generally speaking, lots of people will be working on different articles for developer.lassian.com at different times. But generally speaking, they're not cooperating. They are each operating in their own directory. Each article exists in its own directory, and the people are all working on that. We also have a staging ser server that, where we push up all the cha changes. Now, obviously, if I make a change to my article and say push, and that pushes up to the, my branch gets pushed up to the uh, development. Uh, so the staging ser server, um, I'm going to stomp over whatever changes other people have made because I haven't incorporated them into my branch. I'm working in my own feature branch, my own article branch. Meanwhile, Tim does the same thing, do -do -do -do, commit, push, our bamboo continuous integration server automatically goes off and pushes that up, stomps over mine. If you go to the staging server, you'll only see the last commit, not all the articles that are currently being, w being worked on. But because there are very, there's very little or no overlap between the two br these br branches, or these dozens of branches of the articles might be worked on at any given time. We use the octopus merge. We say take all of the current unmerged br branches that have the word blog in the title and merge them all together. Octopus merges, if you do have conflicts, are an absolute nightmare to unravel. But if you know that you have a bunch of different code that has no o overlap, or different branches that have no overlap between them, maybe some people are working on different module systems and so on, you can pull them in and have a, br a merge commit which has multiple parents, possibly even dozens. Um, there's one called, and then another merge strategy called ours. Ours is when, and it's, I don't know how many people have done this, but you do see it occasionally. We've had it once or twice at the last year, not, not, not often. You're working on a new version of your tool, your application, and you've got version two, and now you're working on version three. Meanwhile, you're, work, you're also doing patches and so on, fixes on version 2. But the version 3 is completely different, entire new tool set, using compl something completely di di different. You've gone from iPhone to an, uh, Android, or you're, you know, you've completely you've gone from G GTK to you know, whatever, whatever, pure HTML, native, whatever. The two applications now have no relation to each other. When you go to release version 3, you want it to become the new master. You want to completely replace and o overwrite the previous history. You don't destroy the old history. You merely want to say, I'm going to merge this in, but don't even try and do an actual merge. Just take the, th this new branch and pretend it's, the, it's been merged in, but don't actually try and do the merge. It's like completing, basically overlaying one completely different piece of history on top of another. So that's what ours does. It gives you the ability to say, create a merge, but pretend that we completely destroyed it. Now, you can do that manually. You can literally just do delete, add your file in, all your files in, and then do a commit. But that's not going to tell you very much. What you want is that branch history that tells you the branches occur the branches were merged here because we did a release of version 3, and it's a completely superseded version 2. But we want version 2's history to remain around as well. We want that merge point to occur as well. Subtree is an interesting one. I won't go into it too much here. Um, subversion had exter externals, externs, that allowed you to pull in other subversion repositories into a, another repository as, a, as dependencies. Subtree is the closest answer that Git has to that. It can take another repository and pull it in as a, as a subdirectory of your current um, repository. Um, it's handy. I use it, for instance, when I've got my very complex Emacs set up, and I want to pull in various modules. I want to lock them to certain ver versions. So what I do is I actually go to the Git repository and say, pull in this tag of the closure mode um, uh, tool and put it into the, the lib sub subdirectory, the lisp sub subdirectory. And then later, if I want to, I can go do a pull from a different tag and pull that down. And so Git subtree understands that. It understands that there is a, a one repository may rely on other repositories. The other thing, though, is this is, as you can see, pluggable. That's quite interesting. Um, if you've got some proprietary file format, it's binary. Git doesn't understand it. It can't mer merge that. It'll just replace one, one, one with, the, uh, with the other. But what if it's internally? It's a tree model. Say it's uh, one would be MKV files, if you know those uh, uh, Matroskas. They're essentially binary XML. You can actually merge these together. You explode them out. You two look, to look at two files, explode them out, look at the endpoints, merge them together. XML, you could do that. XML, if you've got two, if they've auto-generated XML, it might look complete, uh, 
complete nonsense when you try and merge them because they're all in different, all, everything's in different places. You try and merge them as text files, but if you know that they're XML files, you blog them out into a DOM, look at the endpoints, merge only the bits that have changed, and then dump that back out again. So this is possible. If you have some proprietary file format, you can plug in your own merge system. The other thing I look to talk about is uh, what is a re rebase. Um, again, this is one of those things that everyone sort of looked at and gone, oh, this is great. Um, I'm going to do this and then screw up. So re rebase is one of those things. In one of those, rebase is one of those things in Git where um, it's very, very powerful, but it should be used very carefully indeed. What it will do, say you want to actually have fast forward mer mer sorry, have a fast forward merge. You, you want to keep a clean history and look like it's a, li a linear line. How do you do that? Well, what you, you can do, you can tell Git to rebase to a certain point. Pretend history didn't occur. You replay commits on top of each other. Now, it doesn't merge at each step along the way. But this is very, very powerful, and I'll come to this in a bit, because if you're replaying history, you can change history. And I'll show you how to use that in a, in a, little, in a little bit. Now, I'm actually getting a little bit out, out of time, so I'm going to rush forward a bit quickly here um, and introduce you a couple of core con concepts of how we can use this to get out of trouble. This is really sort of the, um, you know, the payoff at the end now is how do you get out of trouble in Git using what we've just learned? We've shown you how to get into tr uh, trouble as well. By the way, this is, a, this is I think, that you've in Australia. It's actually the, uh, the advertisement, TV advertisement for the original um, Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. So if you have played that game, you'll understand that. So quickly, I'm going to show you a couple of ways that we can get out of the trouble we've managed to get ourselves into. I'll show you how to get in. Let's show you how to get out. Okay. Reset hard. We've blown away our, um, our working tree. Um, we've moved the history. Oh, shit, I shouldn't have done that. I wanted that commit. Actually, how do I get out of it? Anyone know? Nope. Ref log. You have a record of what you just did. You can see that we reset them um, to one step backwards, but we can look at what the previous commit was. We can see where, where we moved from. So we can undo that. The way to get out of that, we just do a different reset. We put our reset back to where it used to be. So I'm going to show that again. We did a reset hard here that moved the tree, moved, moved the ref, and that we have no way of getting that. Unless we know what that magic hash is of that object at the end, because it no longer has anything pointing to it, we need to find out what the hash was to reset it. Well, that's okay because we have it in the ref log and we just do a reset hard again, but we use the hash of the one that, uh, of that end object because we look it up in the ref log. Another one is if you've done, um, if you've done a rebase re and somehow the rebase has broken the build. At what point did the breakage occur? Somewhere along that replayed history, something went wrong. What went wrong? How do we find out where the breakage occurred. Well, we know how to go back to the previous state we were in, the pre-rebase state, because we've got the ref log. So we go to ref log and look at what it was before we did the re-rebase, re what our branch name, our branch tag was pointing at, our branch our reference. So we look it up and then we push it back to the past. Now we can do a re we can try it again. But this time, we're going to put something into the command. It's going to be called exec. Because Git is replaying history, we can actually, at each point in the history, as we replay it, we can do anything we want. We can merge um, different commits together, things like that. And that's where you want to rebase interactive. We're not going to go into that here. We can also do this. We can, ex we can execute any command we want as the rebase is playing. So one of the things that's very useful to do is run all of our tests after each step of the re rebase. If our tests fail, the rebase will stop, and we can go and examine what's happened. So that's it. So basically, it's a way of looking at the, each merge point and ensuring that the merge point is um, sane. Now, there's another one I'm going to show you. This is not so much used in healthy projects. However, it is used in the Linux kernel quite extensively. Not to say that it's not unhealthy, but Linux kernel has different constraints. 
It has a handle, lots of heart hardware in it, but hardware may change over time. It may take months until a regression is noticed. So sometimes you have to go back into history and find out what broke. We can't replay a thing, or we can, because it's Git, and we can go back and look at any point in history. So Git has something called bisect. Bisect gives you the ability to say, I know that the, car this, the current um, point we're looking at, the head, is broken. But I know back here at version 1.2, there were, that regression didn't occur. What happened? So we tell Git, this is the good point, and this is the bad point. Please go off and find me the midpoint between these two commits. Um, and now you can do this manually. If you're doing the Linux kernel, you, you can manually go and check these things. You pretty much have to if you're doing hardware regression testing. But in the case of you've got automated test suite, which I hope you have, you can just run that automated test suite each step along the way, and Git will do that all, uh, automatically for you. What it will do, it will go back and find the midpoint and say, is this midpoint broken? Well, let's run, run the test and find out. No, right. In that case, the breakage must be somewhere in the future. Let me find the next midpoint between these two points. So it's an automated way of doing this, of uh, doing regression testing. So it's another way of fixing things. Now, I'm going to run through one thing very, very quickly, because I am officially out of time, and Jez is going to come and shout at me in a bit. I'm going to introduce that one weird trick, powers of invisibility. Now, we know about objects, and we know about trees, and we know that objects can, have, can exist inside Git repositories. Why do they have to be part of a tree? Why can't it be part of another tree? Why can't they just not exist in themselves? You can hide files inside Git. Unless you know its name, the file is invisible to you. It's not part of any history. And I'll show you how to do that quickly. Now, this is an example of where, if you know how Git works, you must know that this is possible. I didn't know any of the commands here, but I knew this must be possible, and I went out and found what the commands are, because I understood the underlying Git model. How do we do something like that? Well. We know that objects have hashes. So there must be a hash object command to look up the hash of a file, theoretically. So we can take any file that's in, in here. We've got a hidden file. I'm going to create it, and we'll destroy it afterwards. Um, git hash object, and that will tell me the hash of a, gi gi a given object, or what it would be if I put it into the, uh, into, into the repository. Now, uh, there's also a minus W that says, actually do that. Put it into the repository. Create an object from this file. Don't bother its file name or anything like that. Just put the contents of this file into the repository. And it's just sitting there, floating. No, not part of any chain of commits, no trees, no nothing. Now, that's not a great amount of use to you, because what's going to happen is, obviously, in two weeks' time, GC is going to come along and go, oh, that's not being pointed to by anything. So it's going to destroy it unless we give it a name. In this case, a tag. It could just be a ref, but we're going to use a tag. It seems, seems appropriate to it. So when the hash was created, we had uh, the hash. When we now use the hash to create a tag called hidden. And now we go off and we delete that file. And we, go back, we change back to our um, main branch, our master branch. That, file, that object is floating there. It'll never be destroyed and it'll have no record in there beyond being in the ref log. There's no commits associated with it, no trees, no nothing. It's a blob of information hidden in, in there. How do we get that out? Well, we've got the tag. If we know the name, we know that it must be some way of getting this out. Then I went, oh, there must be some way. Let's look through the, through the manuals. There you go. We've got cat file. Cat file will take a, any reference or hash, and it will pull out that information and dump it out onto the screen. So let's run that. And here we've got well, what is the, con the content of that. That's the old Smith family recipe for pachin. Um, got an I Irish background, and some of it is highly suspicious, which is why my name is Smith. Now, I, bl I believe that they're on a lamb from the, uh, the tax man in I Ireland. Now, this seems a little theoretical. It's interesting. It's a bit of fun. However, it is actually used. Um, Fun story, when they were um, adding Git to uh, support a Bitbucket, it kept blowing up when they were trying to pull in the Git repository. 
The reason was someone had hidden a, an object in there and they, weren't, uh, they had no idea about this. What happens inside the Git repository itself, Git's own Git repository, Ju Junio, who's the maintainer, has dumped his PGP key so that you can actually verify um, the repository against itself um, and verify the history. It's just hidden in there and it blew up Bitbucket when we were trying to add um, Git support to it. Um, so that's it. So I'm well and truly out of time now. Um, please use the app to rate, um, and there will be a, um, uh, a speaker's clinic up the other end. I haven't, I'm not sure the title where it is, but I'll go and find it. If I, if I can find it, I'm sure you, uh, you can too. But just to recap, that is Git in its fundamental element. Objects that are trees, that can be commits, that point to each other, and you can chain your commits to get to, together, and that gives you history. So. Now, with Smart, go off and um, hack on your Git repositories, go poke around, see what happens, and do it on your production one as well. That's fine. Don't worry about that. So have fun. Thank you. See you later. Good. <laughs>